That's all I can promise. <laughs> um, all right, has anybody actually seen any of my presentations before? Anybody not have no idea who I am? That's okay. <laughs> all right, blame these guys for the extra time we got to take. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm kidding. So I, I actually grew up in Oregon, and uh, the reason I'm telling you that is I, I want you to kind of know how I got to, into even doing this. I grew up a very poor kid in Oregon. My father was a total, I love him, he's passed on, but a deadbeat dad who could never overcome substance abuse. Left us at a very young age, was replaced by an amazing stepfather. Um, and, but, you know, I was the kind of kid that when we took off to college, nobody had ever gone. Nobody had really ever served missions in the church. And uh, nobody had ever made, you know, much money. We were, anybody remember like actual poverty back when we were young? Like today, I don't know if people know what poverty is anymore because you can go get steaks with your welfare card these days, which uh, is awesome, right? Because when I was a kid, cereal on welfare was called Product 19. Anybody remember that? Oh, wow. So we didn't even name it. Like you weren't even good enough to have a name on your cereal. It was just like the government Product 19. And cheese was like that big, came in a block, pretty sure it was extruded from some sort of machine. And so I went to Rick's College. Uh, I had kind of dreamed of escaping, and my escape was the church. Uh, as a kid who grew up in the church, in spite of all that trouble, I had, I was, I had Boy Scouts and, and church, and so I wanted to go to a church school. I wanted to experience what it you know, was to be a, a real Mormon kid in a Mormon place. I ended up totally flunking out of my first year at college. Kids, plug your ears. Do not imitate what I've done. <laughs> uh, my grade point average in my first semester had a four in it. Anybody want to guess what it was? It was a point four. Oh. So, so, so bad. <laughs> so bad. And they were like, hey, if you don't get this up, we're going to have to kick you out. So I brought it up to a point nine by the next semester, and sure enough, Rick's college kicked me out of school. Well, you know what you do when you're a young Mormon kid and you get kicked out of school? Go on a mission. Go on a mission. And then they take you back when you're done. So my, my only way to remediate that was to go on a mission and hope Rick's would take me back. And sure enough, they did. And I met my wife at Rick's college. Uh, we, we got married in 1995. We've been married ever since. We have five kids. We moved to Utah and did an internship in Washington, D.C. when we were at the University of Utah. And I went to the White House Council on Environmental Equality, and my wife went to the Supreme Court. I was a Clinton White House intern. Clinton's vice president was, as you know, Al Gore. And they were very environmentally oriented. So I was working in the Council on Environmental Quality. I was an environmental studies major. And what's interesting about doing that is I realized in Washington, D.C. that I was not a Democrat. Sorry, Democrats. And of course, you know, as an American, if you're not going to be a Democrat, you are a Republican, which is insane. Yeah. Really think about that. Yeah. That's insane. And why is that insane? Since when do Americans buy into the fact that you can only choose one of two things yeah. in a free country? What do we call it when you only have two choices? It's right. called a cartel. <laughs> right? So America's political system, and this took me a long time to realize this, because if you're not going to be a Democrat, then you need to be a Republican. If you're a Mormon in Utah and you're a Republican, then you're not just a Republican, you're a massively conservative Republican, right? And that's what I became. But one day, I'm, I, I actually went home and I ran for the Utah State Legislature and I got a seat at the age of 28 in the Utah House. I spent two terms there and one thing that really shocked me, I've remembered it my whole life, is I was in the back lounge of the House chambers, kind of behind the meeting assembly room, and President Faust was in the first presidency and he had been a state legislator when he was young and he had been asked to give the prayer. So here, you know, I'm a, I'm a kid from Oregon. I, I've never seen apostles. I, I don't come from Mormon royalty at all. I'm like what you'd call an absolute Mormon mutt. And I have no <laughs> royal heritage, not even pioneers, right? So 
he comes walking in. I'm like starstruck. That here's President Faust. This is amazing. I'm, you know, I'm this far away from him. And the majority, the minority leader for the Democrat Party is there with me. And he says to President Faust, hey, President Faust, I understand you used to be a Democrat, which he was. And he says, I have risen above such things. And I wanted to be like, so you've become a Republican. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't say it because I was like, that would be irreverent. And I'd probably get, you know, at that time I was thinking, I shouldn't say those kind of things. You don't joke with an apostle. If only I had known, you probably should. So I just kind of listened to that, and it resonated with me. Why would he say that? What did he mean? And I, I, I never forgot that. So after I resigned from the house, I went to law school in Michigan, to a little private Catholic law school. Uh, had some amazing teachers. Anybody know who Judge Bork is? He was my constitutional law professor at, at school. Um, I had an amazing property law teacher. They were a natural law school, which is interesting for Catholics because America is a difficult thing for Catholics. Anybody ever been a Catholic? Because, you know, yeah, so the Pope is in Rome, not in America. And if, if these rascalous, you know, founding fathers are doing something inspired by God, where's the Pope? So that's a little difficult for Catholic, especially, you know, natural law, Catholic legal scholars. And they did an amazing job kind of bridging that gap and teaching some really wonderful concepts. One of my teachers was a guy named Bruce Fronin who wrote the book, The American Republic, Primary Sources, which if you don't have, get it. It's, a, it's amazing. And it's all the primary source documents behind America's founding. Like if you've ever wondered in your mind why we call ourselves a democracy, that's n no offense, it's just not an appropriate term. There's no such thing as a democracy in the, in the history of the world. That's kind of a modern made up term. And in there you can read about why. Where did the concept of a democracy come from? What was it to the founding fathers? It's amazing. Such a good book. Anyway, he was one of my teachers. And I, I left from there and I thought, man, I'm, I'm never going back into politics again. If I do, I'm going to go to make money. Right? Because that's the, what else do you do in politics? I mean, how many virtuous politicians do we ever see that last on either side? Right? You just get in there and you just get beat up. Even locally, you try to commit yourself to <clears throat> principles. And it's just, it's just inviting people to, to hit you with a bat. So <laughs> I did, though. I went back. I ran for office again. I lost. It was horrible. My wife said to me, do you really want to keep losing? I'm like, no, if my wife is saying that to me, it's probably, it's probably time to be done. And so I, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to have to go actually be a lawyer, which you know I was trained to do, and I never wanted to be a lawyer. So I got a phone call after I finally decided to kind of hang up the hat in the world of politics, and I got a call from a guy named Ammon well, Ryan Bundy at the time. Anybody ever heard of the Bundy family? <laughs> Not the serial killers. <laughs> the ranchers from Nevada. You may remember there was this big standoff in 2014 between a bunch of ranchers and the United States government in Oregon. And then some of the boys, or not, sorry, not in Oregon, in Nevada. And then some of the boys, uh, and they didn't get prosecuted for that. I don't know if you followed that. They didn't at the time. So 2014, they get on their horses, they get thousands of people, and they put their guns on their shoulders. Can you imagine doing that to the federal government? <laughs> going to a protest with your guns? And then not only going to a protest with your guns, but the federal government's down in this thing called the wash. If you've ever driven down to Las Vegas from St. George, Utah, you'll cross over this place. And the government, through the BLM, which interestingly, I didn't mean to get into this tonight, but... But it, there's a few interesting things to observe about this moment in American time. It's actually a profound moment in modern American history. Um, I, I, I get tempted to go down these little rabbit holes, so if I do, <laughs> just remind me to come back out where we were. Um, you know, imagine going to a rally where the government has intentionally planned a confrontation. And their purpose is to impound cows 
from a rancher who is allegedly grazing his cows on government property when he's not supposed to. Now, and this rancher manages to draw thousands of people to his protest in Nevada in a place called Bunkerville, middle of nowhere. Well, what we found out is that the government had set up a social media operation in the town nearby in a hotel, created tons of fake media profiles, and were enticing people to come and join the rally against them. Oh. Wow. Think about that. Why would you do that? Now, add to that that you didn't just bring the BLM, the Forest Service, and the National Park Service to this confrontation. You brought elite warriors who are former special operators from the military that you've hired into what's called the Department or Office of Law Enforcement Services in the Department of Interior. You go to the FBI, you produce what's called a behavioral analysis on the people that you are confronting, these crazy ranchers, right? Because they could be domestic terrorists. The report comes back and says they are not dangerous. Do not do these things. It, this literally happened. So you take the report, you bury it. As a federal officer, you create your own report which says they are dangerous and recommends that you do everything the behavioral analysis said not to do. Then you train dogs and agents to create a protest. You bring the protest. What do you call that? <laughs> Touche. Um, why? What do you, you know? There's a legal term of art for this. It's called entrapment. Yeah. And you ask yourself, why would they do that? And we found ourselves asking that, and we were forbidden from speaking about this as attorneys. Um, in both cases, we ended up in two different places, Oregon and Nevada, because there were two different incidents. But, um, you know, who, who, who knows they're facing that? Now, I've, I've got to finish that thought. The Forest Service has snipers. Mm. Do you know that? The Bureau of Land Management, which is pro you probably don't have to deal with here. We deal with it a lot out in the West. They have a, a SWAT team. And they're, they're former special operators. These guys aren't just, you know, cops we hire off the beat. These guys are former special forces, and they're being paid $250,000 a year to work on sniper and SWAT teams. They have Bearcats, fully automatic rifles in the West. Because what's wrong with the West? It's the seedbed of modern terrorism. And if you believe that, you know, you've been duped yeah. mm -hmm. because there is no terrorism in Utah and there's no terrorism in the borders of Utah. They might, I, I can't speak for Northern Idaho. They get a little bit weird up there, but I still don't <laughs> think they've, they've hit that level. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, these are where the oper this operation is happening against these ranchers. They're being entrapped by the government. And then the government, you know, they, they actually, the ranchers come down and they, they take all these people that the government is throwing at them we actually proved that there were agent provocateurs and uh, informants that they were paying to go in and incite violence. Like we proved this in court, right? I mean, this is why we ended up winning both cases in Oregon and Nevada. And um, so imagine confronting that and, and what these, these guys are all Mormon, right? The Bundys, that's who I was representing, Ammon Bundy. They, uh, they're like, hey, we're going to exercise our First Amendment right. And you can't exercise your First Amendment right without your Second Amendment right. So everybody bring your guns. <laughs> it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. But they win. And the government backs down right at the confrontation point. The government goes away. They don't prosecute them. And so these guys are like, well, hey, let's do that again. And so they run up to Oregon and literally take over a federal wildlife refuge and again bring their guns. So finally the government prosecutes them for that one. We went to trial in Oregon in front of a Portland jury. We won a unanimous verdict of not guilty. We then went to Nevada and the judge 
who was an, appointed by Barack Obama and Harry Reid, so probably a liberal, right? Not going to like conservative ranchers and Mormon lawyers, and we won. She threw the case out for outrageous prosecutorial misconduct. So imagine what that takes. So by the time I'm done with the Bundy case, I'm like thinking, man, that's great. That's a huge victory. I can put that on my resume. No. Nope. From that point on, the government went after our bar licenses in every state we practiced, uh. filing complaints against us. And the lawyers who we proved were guilty of outrageous prosecutorial misconduct were never censured and to this day still work under full salary for the United States government in Nevada. So by the time, by the time that was over, I was, I was done, right? I, I got through that. Um, they prosecuted my partner. They arrested him in court. After we won, the US Marshals converged on my partner while he was literally standing this far away from me. While he was giving his closing argument, they, uh, or his argument on why Ammon should be released from prison, they came forward, tackled him, tased him, and arrested him wow. for nothing because we had learned that they did not have transfer orders for Ammon to take him to Nevada, and we were calling them out on it. So I graduated from being a conspiracy theorist to a conspiracy realist, realist? <laughs> because I had proven a government conspiracy. Yeah. Now, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna touch on a little side note here because this things get a little bit crazy. You'll appreciate this now, but we didn't at the time. In 2016, we, when we went to trial in Oregon, there's this thing called discovery. So the government will take everything it has relevant to your case and they'll give it to you. That's called discovery. So imagine how much information the government stores up. Well, it turns out in 2016, when they gave us the discovery, inside the discovery was kind of this packet of information about an AI they were using. Okay, now imagine seeing that in 2016. You'd be like, what do you mean an AI? <laughs> What's, you know, like minority report? <laughs> That's exactly what it was. They were using an artificial intelligence to monitor American citizens, everything they did, including illegal surveillance of attorney-client phone calls in jail, and prior to that, they were using the AI to generate probable cause statements on potential problematic American citizens. Mm -hmm. That's Minority Report, science fiction. So at the time, we're like, I don't even know what to do with this in 2016. Now jump forward to 2022, 2023, 24. You see why that would be troubling today? The American government has been using an AI program since before 2015 on American citizens surveilling them. Now, again, I didn't actually mean to come here and talk about the law, okay? Um, but, but, but all of that, imagine going through all of that, you know, 20, 23 years of politics and law to then arrive at 2020 COVID, okay? So I've already graduated from conspiracy school and now COVID hits. And here's what's interesting about COVID that for me was kind of an eye opener. How many of you can name a time in the history of the world when the world was united? Just once. World War II? No. Nope. World War I? No. no. COVID united the world. Am I wrong? No. You could go to the Caribbean on vacation and they were implementing the same policies. They were receiving the same monies. You could go to Ecuador, same thing. China, same thing. Europe, same thing. America, same thing. Why? Why did COVID unite the world? Because we were all experiencing that same time. Fear. We're all experiencing the same time. It, it's a thing of fear that's hard to quantify as an, 
as an average citizen, right? I don't know what COVID is. I'm not qualified to say if COVID is dangerous. I, all I know is that the whole world all of a sudden is like, hey, this is um, dangerous and lots of people could die. And so I think most people were like, no, we don't want that. What do we need to do? And then all of a sudden there was this top-down policy dispensed everywhere around the world about what we should do. Well, it turns out that it wasn't as bad as they thought. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, okay? I have no idea. But a group of mothers and fathers came to me and said, hey, will you be our lawyer? Will you file a lawsuit against the state of Utah because every child has a right to a free and public education? And we have kids who don't have COVID who are being contact traced to other kids who do and they are being excluded from school and we think that is unconstitutional and we want you to sue the government. And I was like, man, I'm like getting ready to get out of here. I think the world's gone crazy. I, I'm like ready to jump off the crazy cliff right now and just admit that I'm a wacko because I don't get this. Right? So the last thing I want to do is like go back into the courts and be the poster child for like, hey, COVID's a conspiracy. Go save the kids. And so I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do that. And they were like, please, please. And so I was like, okay, listen. If you will sit down with me for about six, because by this time, I, I'd kind of been leaning this way, right? I'm ready to jump from being kind of a political conspiracy theorist to a Jesus freak because of COVID. And so I'm about ready to jump off that cliff. And these guys are like, wait, wait, come back and sue the government. And I'm like, but Jesus, you know? And so I'm like, look, if you'll let me talk about him for six hours and how it relates to COVID, then maybe I'll file. And they were like, okay. I was like, what? You know, that's, that's not the answer I was expecting. So they did, and we sat down from like 6 p.m. to 2, 2 a.m. Oh my gosh. And some of them were not members of the church. Can you imagine wow. that? And they were like, okay, we agree. I was like, what? You know, like, <laughs> I didn't expect that answer either. And then they were like, hey, will you go do this down here for this group of people? And I said, yeah, I guess I will. And that started this. And I've been doing that for basically almost four years. And I've probably done, you know, 250 to 350 of these. And it started, you know, I like smaller groups because it's personal. And in poli that's the opposite of politics. It's the opposite of the legal world, right? Everything there is money, crowds, influence, size, capacity, right? You want it bigger and bigger. And I just don't think that's how we're going to fix anything. I don't think we're going to fix anything by Republican Democrat politics. In fact, we should be so thoroughly convinced of that because all that either party has done is in debt America. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, maybe you're for debt. I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I'm, if you are, someday somebody's got to pay for it. And so I started to ask myself, well, what's the answer? You know, if, if if COVID, and, and here's what really disturbed me, after all I'd been through already, to see us close churches mm -hmm. was weird. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, well, I, I get why people don't like guns. I get that. I, I don't agree with it personally, but I get it. I even get the arguments. But I don't understand how America ever closes churches. I don't care if this group of people wants to go in and cough all over each other and you want to lock them in it and burn them, right? I don't agree with that, but that's happened in history, right? We do that to people, and that kind of happened during, if you're going to go, we're going to arrest you. If you're going to sing, we're going to arrest you. You can't sing here. You can't do this here, but you can do it over here if you're part of a protest or blah, 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 blah. Was, I was like, man, we have gone insane. And so I was like, well, hold on. If I really believe in Christ, what would he be doing? And then I had all these friends who were like, you know, I don't, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I, I'm assuming I'm dealing with a crowd that understands kind of the culture and history of the LDS church. If you don't, just kind of secretly poke your hand up in the back and I'll like try and explain some things. But in particularly, you know, in the LDS community, I, I couldn't understand. I had friends who were like, I don't understand what the church is doing right now. You know, like, for example, I just saw President Nelson, the prophet of the church, 
with wearing a black mask and getting a shot, and I'm against it. And they'd be like, ah, do I have to leave now? And I'd be like, why would that mean you have to leave? You know, because of this. And then people on the other side, I can't believe you're not doing it. And so I was like, man, what, if, what do I do here? I guess, and, and I had been programmed my entire life to say, well, well, you go run for office. You go back into politics. You start to organize. And we got to get control of the Republican slash Democrat party. And if we do, then we will have power and then we can change something, right? That's how it works. And that guy is not in the equation, right? Mm -hmm. In the Republican party, we don't need him. I mean, he likes us better than he does the Democrats. <laughs> so, and that's what we think. And the Democrats were like, well, I don't know if I really believe in him, but we do his stuff more than you do, even if I don't, because you people hate kids and, you know, education. And Republicans are like, yeah, you know how that goes, right? He's just not in the equation. And for the first time in my life, I was like, no, he's got to be the equation, period. And if the Republican Party won't embrace him, I'm out. And I could go to the Democrat Party if you'll embrace him, but they won't either. So maybe I'm a libertarian. Guess what? They don't either. So where is this guy post-COVID? So I'm a contrarian, okay? And I saw other people who were like, oh my gosh, you know, the church is true, or the scriptures are real, or Jesus is coming, and people going like, no, it's not true anymore at all. And I was like, okay, I got to do some of this. And somebody had posted this post on Facebook. And it was like, okay, now, now I'm jumping somewhere I shouldn't. No, this is right. This is a good order. <laughs> Anybody follow Utah News? Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily blame Every it. now and then it'll pop up, you know. In this let me tell you. Let me tell you why you should follow certain aspects of Utah. Okay, if I were to say to you as a Latter-day Saint, have you had your patriarchal blessing? Most Latter-day Saints would say, yeah, I have. Mm -hmm. And you are from the tribe of, and a Latter-day Saint would be like Ephraim, right? Or, or whatever tribe you're from. And the Ephraimites would be like, and that's why I'm special. You know, because I'm an Ephraimite and you're just a Manassan and we Watch got it. the birthright. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you, see what I'm, you see what I'm saying though? That's, but that can't be true. Why? God is no respecter of because persons. God is no respecter of persons. So what does it mean to actually get an assignment of a tribe and a patriarchal blessing? A duty. You really think your blood makes you better than somebody else? No. No way. No way. So it cannot be about blood. So what's it about? Your responsibility. It's about a responsibility. It's yeah. about a duty. So... When God creates organizational structures, he doesn't do it because you're special. He doesn't do it because you're better. He does it to create duty. And the question is, will you accept the duty? That's it. And you don't have to. And in order to have that kind of an organizational structure or to, to create an entity that can govern it has to be able to be in tune. Okay, now, if, if I'm a, an astronomer, what do I set up in order to attune myself to space? And ideally, an observatory in a special place that is uniquely qualified to observe the phenomenon I want to study. That's why God creates headquarters and places, because the places become observatories by which we are supposed to bring things in, observe things, and share them with the rest of the world. Utah is the Lord's modern observatory. It's not special. It's just an observatory. And if the people of the place corrupt themselves, they're not special. They're going to get destroyed like everybody else, but you still need to follow the things that are coming through there, the observations. Why do I say that? Because on March 18th, 
of 2020, there was an earthquake in Utah. Mm -hmm. You know this? Mm -hmm. And it did what? The Trump yeah. Okay, and that's what somebody posted on Facebook, and then they posted, this must be Amos chapter 3, where the horn falls off of the altar. And I was like, no, that can't be it. Because those horns are animal horns, and there's four of them, and they don't really have the same symbolism as Moroni's trumpet. Therefore, ha ha, you're wrong. You know, that's kind of the type of guy I am. <laughs> and I know I shouldn't be like that, right? But, but I kind of am. And, and so I was like, so what does that mean? Because it seems to mean something. And I started to study that. What did it mean, if anything? And then the moment you kind of open yourself up to that, you know, like, welcome to Christian conspiracy land. Because <laughs> post-2020, I mean, there is no shortage of crazy stuff today. So, but I, I, I wanted to understand that because, honestly, COVID, to me, is very unique. Mm -hmm. it, it, and I'll tell you why. As an attorney, one of the most fundamental aspects of American legal rights or due process is your right to a jury trial. Okay, now I would put next to that, this is kind of a judicial, judicially administered right, jury trials. Next to that is an executive power called martial law. Put next to that kind of a democratic exercise of rights, of this thing that is exercised by the people, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, redress, freedom of conscience, right? you see what that is, that's First Amendment. All of those things happen in 2020. You lost your jury trial, right? Most people didn't even know. You were treated like a domestic terrorist, most people didn't know, because the government could now detain you without a jury trial, and they could cordon you off from all of society due to COVID, and your only due process came over a small, video feed to the court where nobody was present. That is highly disturbing mm -hmm. from a legal due process perspective. Now, Utah went into martial law for two years and hardly anybody knew it. How can you go into martial law and nobody knows? That's highly disturbing. And then of course, you know we shut down churches and schools one of my clients in 2020 had his son who was contact traced to another kid with COVID. They took that child and imprisoned him in a closet for two days at school without parental permission. What? Crazy, right? I mean, all these things, really, really disturbing. And yet nobody really seemed to care. So I said to myself, something is happening. And I, let's pretend for a second, 2020 was the second coming, right? I wasn't ready, not even close. And I'm, all, I, I'm like thinking I'm, I'm better than other people, why? Because I'm active in politics. I'm better than other people because I'm LDS. I, blah, 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 you know the story, right? The thing, we, we all try to achieve that status, the ideal Mormon, right? And, and the farther we are up that trail and the more people in our wake, the better off we're doing. And in 2020, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a total failure. Because if 2020 had been the second coming, I was woefully unprepared. So I, I remember sitting in conference, President Nelson calls upon the church to fast and says, will you consider sacrificing something as part of your fast on Good Friday? And I can't tell you how profoundly that affected me and how wicked I felt. I know that's a weird term. It's a very religious term, right? But I did. And I felt that way because I wasn't prepared to protect my wife and my five kids. And I knew I needed to repent for the first time, right? And I don't mean just like, like we all think, oh, I, I need to be better. I was like, no, I'm, I really need to repent. And so I tried to. I'm not very good at it still, but I'm a little bit better. And I... I took that seriously and that changed my life and it helped me understand more 
about politics, about scriptures, and about the latter days because I started to very diligently study the scriptures. And I realized that the, the solution to all the problems we face as a you know, individual, family, society is never going to be solved by politics. It is the Lord. And I found that the doctrine of his second coming is unbelievably persuasive. But we, as LDS people, don't believe in it. And we say we do, right? But I'm convinced we don't. And I want to show you why. Okay, and I'm not going to dwell on why we don't. I want to dwell on why we should. And I want to share with you some... Uh, hold on, let me... My kids... I usually don't do this, but when my kids... <laughs> We live off-grid now. We not only moved out of the city, we moved out in the middle of nowhere and went off-grid in 2021. So when my kids text, it could mean the power is out. <laughs> and i got to help them get the power back on. Um, but they're okay. So, um, If you think about, one, I, I would ask yourself very sincerely, if you actually believe in Christ. And I, I don't care if you do or don't. I, I get if you don't. I, I think that's a very legitimate thing to contemplate. And I had to do that because in 2020, my testimony was primarily of Joseph Smith, the church, and the Book of Mormon. I don't think that's bad. But I think a testimony of him is more important than that. And so I had to kind of reconcile that problem to understand if I liked him. Because he is so far removed from me. I can take Joseph Smith and kind of pull him down to me. And I can get that guy. I don't get him. I don't understand a guy who says to me, I don't want anything from you except for your sins. That does not compute to me. I don't like people. I don't like most people's <laughs> opinions. So to have a guy who is like, I like everybody. I want everybody's sins. I'm like, that, you're an alien to me, right? That's, that doesn't, I don't get that. So when I got my testimony of him, when he reached out to me and said, all I want are your sins and your loyalty, I was like, that's unreal. And I want to follow you. Because anybody who can be like that, that's my guy. That's the guy I want to serve. And here's the other proposition I would make if you struggle with that. Let's pretend none of it's true. Okay? <coughs> Honestly, who makes the best offer in kind of the life scheme. Buddha, maybe, enlightenment, or even if it's not real, eternal life. You get to be young again and live forever. It's pretty sweet, <laughs> right? So let's say it's not true though. Why, and I honestly, I think this is important. Isn't that objective? from a guy who says, let's love each other and be kind, can you think of any better offer? Imagine if everybody was just like, yeah, it's not true, but I like the idea of eternal life and immortal youth, and I like the idea of everybody loving me. That's that guy. Even if it's not real, that's awesome. And show me one place better. Show me one offer that's better. And to me, that offer is worth struggling towards. It's worth taking the time to simply ask, is that real? And that's what I did. I mean, in, in kind of fewer words than, than the real experience, that's what I chose to do in 2020. And then I started to take all of my political experience, all of my legal experience, and pour it into evidences of the truthfulness of Christ. And I don't mean like, hey, I feel good, right? I mean, 
touch points of evidence throughout scripture, life, circumstance that cannot be predicted by the human mind. Okay? And, and that's kind of where I want to go with you tonight. I want to show you this, though, real quick. This is President Nelson, 2022. How many of you remember President Hinckley? Positive or negative guy? Positive. Super positive. President Monson. Positive. Who's the last doomsayer prophet you can think of? Benson. Okay, arguably Benson, but the moment he gets into the presidency, he... Cheers up a bit. Cheers up a bit. It's like super disappointing. <laughs> and so when President Nelson gets in and he starts saying things like this, I'm like, whoa. You know, COVID is two years old by this time. But what are the evil and darker signs of the times? That's weird. That's alarmist. And I'm not used to having an alarmist prophet at the head of the church. Right. Okay, now, if you study the New Testament and the Old Testament, even the book of Enoch and 2nd Esdras from the Apocrypha, guess what is common throughout all of these places and, and prophets? They all ask a similar question. And rarely is the question about the first coming of Christ, which is odd. Because we tend to focus on the atoning sacrifice, which unbelievably important, right? And because it's so unbelievably important, why would Peter, James, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke be focusing on that question? That doesn't make sense. And whenever you find something in scripture that doesn't make sense, you have to ask yourself, then why is it there? Why would you do something, why would you write something contrary to reason? Because it seems to me, and watch, watch what happens, all of these chapters, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, all are the same conversation. The disciples are with Christ at the temple. He says something about the temple being destroyed, inferring that he will die, and they are freaking out. And they're all coming out of the temple with the same questions. What did you just mean? And so we get this conversation. Basically, it begins like, hey, they're... The, you just talked about the temple being thrown down, that magnificent temple. What did you mean by that? And he takes him over to the Mount of Olives, and he lays out everything that's going to happen between the time he dies and Jerusalem is destroyed. Okay, now, why? Now again, this doesn't make sense. Why would you do that when this is the question? Why would you revisit? Okay, it's not, it's not a revisitation. Let's just kind of go through the conversation ourselves. Hey, Lord, we were just over there. 7 o'clock. Okay, we got a break here. Hey, Lord, we're just over there in the temple, and you said something really disturbing about the temple being thrown down and you being killed. Will you please explain to us what is the sign of your second coming? Hmm. And now to answer that question, he doesn't answer it. He gives them future prophecy of what's going to happen from the time he dies to the throwing down of the temple in Jerusalem in approximately 70 AD. You know, why would he do this? He didn't answer the question. Now look at what he says, okay? And, and understand that we have three chapters dedicated to this. And not just three, we've got two others from Latter-day Revelation. Anybody know what they are? DNC 45, 45 and Joseph Smith Matthew 1 in the Joseph Smith translation. Okay, I, you're not going to be able to see these very well. Let me just zoom out so I can get. Okay, can you kind of see that? Five chapters of scripture dedicated to one conversation. 
How often can you find that in Scripture? Five chapters. Okay, so we have a lot of information in Scripture about the conversation that comes from that question. And what all these ancient prophets seem to want to know is, will you please tell us about your second, second coming? coming? All right, so in this earth life, then we'll break. You have two opportunities guaranteed if you live during that time to see who? Christ. Jesus. Two, only two. So let's say that you are blessed to live in that moment. And rather than taking advantage of the moment, you want to know about the second time. Why? <laughs> He's right there in front of you. And for some reason, you want to dwell on the time you're not going to be around for? Why? It was for us. Okay, because it's for us. This conversation is for us. And it's to teach us what we should be aware of because the warning that he gives is that people like me could show up. What if I'm a false prophet? Okay, why does he say beware of false prophets? Many will come in my name showing great signs and wonders. So a guy like me shows up and says, hey, look at this eclipse. And secretly... On the other end, I'm like trying to get people to subscribe to something and take their money. And I'm selling my books and I'm buying a house. Okay? That's a problem. So the Lord says, Beware. Many will come in my name showing signs and wonders. And then he says the same thing. And hey, guess what? You should all listen to and study the signs and wonders. wonders. And I will send, and not me, President Nelson's, Elder Holland's, in the last day. I would even put Jonathan Kahn in there. I'm not saying the guy's, anybody study Jonathan Kahn? No. He's a Messianic Jew out of New Jersey. He's amazing. Writes these books where he creates parallels between our day and the Bible. And I think guys like that truly are inspired. I think the Lord uses them to, to speak to everybody. So the Lord says both. Hey, beware of guys like that, and hey... You better be listening and studying, and you better be following the signs. So how do you know what to do? How do you know if the second coming is really upon us? Church, you didn't just say church correlation, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's a really funny statement. <laughs> okay, I was like, that. I mean, that's not a, just a funny statement. That's like incredibly good humor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a like genius level humor. Um, okay, yeah. Personal revelation. Personal revelation. Oh. Personal revelation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so personal revelation. What now? Not only do we have this statement by President Nelson about the darker and evil sides of the times. Guess what President Nelson also says? You must get personal revelation, or you will not survive spiritually. Right. Almost every talk he has given has this really kind of alarmist second coming statement packaged into it like another one October of 2020 at the women's conference he tells the sisters of the church to prepare places of security mm -hmm. both temporally and spiritually and I was like that was amazing. What? That was, that was a good one. Yeah. Like, How about the one I had a vivid dream? That's mm -hmm. President Nelson also. So personal revelation is the way. Guys like me are a dime a dozen. I can say anything I want, and it might not be true. And it doesn't matter what I say. What matters is what the Lord says, what he's put in Scripture, and our ability to begin to understand those Scriptures for ourselves, to grow our own personal testimonies, and to then take that and become the people we were meant to be as Latter-day Saints. Not these 
honestly unimpressive milk toast people who don't really do anything spectacular. And so we try to do spectacular things in the world when our inheritance and birthright was to spectacularly testify of the second coming of Christ. That's our job. Mm -hmm. No matter what your talent is, it's not, it may not be mine. Our job as covenant members of the church was to turn those talents to the second coming, to testify at all times in all places as witnesses of Christ. Can I ask a question? Sure. And it's not being controversial, but it's just a question. If we need to rely on personal revelation, which we do, what are we in profit for? Yeah, good what question. What are we in profit for if we, need, if we rely so, on personal revelation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this as very simply as I can. There is a man and there is a woman. And neither is the man without the woman nor the woman without the man and the Lord. Men are patriarchal in nature. They are not of the church by nature. The church is a woman by nature, matriarchal, nurturing, administering in nature. If a man does not have a check and a balance, a man left to himself is unfettered patriarchal power, and men tend to corrupt themselves. And so God blesses us with a church as a check and balance of unfettered patriarchal power to teach a man to come in unto the priesthood by following keys to very specific and limited ordinances. Mm -hmm. And then God says to the man, everything else is yours. All I ask is that you come and kneel before the keys I have given to my apostles. Now, what we tend to do as a church is we idolize those keys and we misplace our loyalty. And we start to look to that level of leadership as an idol rather than a pass-through. And um, that's the Nehushtan or the brass serpent in the story of Hezekiah. We've done the same thing to the church. We've turned the church and our temples into idols. Mm -hmm. So when we go to the church or go to the temple as an mm -hmm. idol, it's not good. When you go to the temple as a symbol of Christ, it is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, let's take a break and get some food, and then we're going to jump into big old parables. <laughs> <laughs>